messengers as bringers of good tidings and warners so that mankind will have no argument against Allah after the messengers. And ever is Allah exalted in might and wise. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Sometimes people ask us questions and we think about it and we wonder what's the answer to this question. One of the questions that we hear a lot of times is, well, if there's a God, how come bad things are happening to good people? And how come sometimes bad people get good things? So where's the justice? Where's the fairness in this? So where's the God? Sometimes you have a difficulty. It gets really hard, really tough. And you think, how come? And some people said, well, if you Muslims, if you Muslims are really in the right way, how come everywhere we look in the world, Muslims have problems? Have you heard something like this before? And the reason for these problems, Allah tells us in the Quran something very clear. And the prophets are the best examples for us to understand it. In the Quran, Allah says, "A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytani rajim bismillahi rahman rahim alif lam mim a hasab nasu an yutraku an yaqulu amana wa hum la yaftalu." What does it mean? And Allah is telling us real clear what happens. The meaning behind it is that Allah is saying, do human beings think that just because they say, I believe in Allah, that they're not going to be tested? And then Allah continues. He said, laqad. Laqad in Arabic, it means absolutely, positively, for sure. He is going to put you into something he calls fitna. Now, fitna is not just a test. Fitna is a deep calamity. It is something really big time. And then he explains that he did the same thing to the people before. Min Kablu. Those who were before us also were put into some big, big tests. Calamities. Fitna. And then he tells us why. It's to show you, so you'll have full knowledge of the ones who are really telling the truth. And who are the Khadibin? Who are the Khadibin? What is Khadib? Do you know? Liars. Liars. The first, who is truthful, which is Sadiq, to say the truth, and Khadib, which is a liar. Now that we understand this, I want to help you, and myself too, really, in understanding some of the things that Allah taught us in the Quran and then sent prophets to make it clear. The Qur'an comes to us like the best kind of operating manual for a human being. When you buy anything at the store, and you go home and you open it up, there's a book in there that tells you how to operate. Maybe it's a new air conditioner. Maybe you've got a new fax machine, or a computer, or a new bicycle. But it always comes with like a little book telling you all about it, yeah? But sometimes you need pictures, and the pictures help you to better understand what the words mean. And so our prophets to us are pictures, pictures in our mind, because we can imagine, wow, you know, the prophet so-and-so, he had this happen to him, and he had that happen to him, and another, and another. And then I can think, hmm, my life's not so bad after all. I can take it, you know? But now I want to tell you about one of the prophets, that prophet who is famous to the Jewish, he's famous to the Christians, and he's very famous to us as well. His name is Ayub. Ayub. And in English they call him Job, but they spell it J-O-B, which looks like Job. But his name is Ayub. Can you say Ayub? Ayub. Alay salam. Alay salam. Now we say peace be upon him. His story is one of the oldest in the old manuscripts. According to the Jewish history, they tell us that perhaps this is one of the oldest manuscripts that they have still intact, and they refer to it as one of the most ancient of all, because it doesn't really talk about the children of Israel or anything like that in the story. In the old manuscripts that they have before the Quran, it tells us 
something about the devil. The devil or Iblis is talking to Allah about this servant. And Allah is very pleased with him. In the Quran we find very similar, very similar. Allah is very pleased, very pleased with who? Ayub. Let's talk about Ayub. First of all, Ayub is worshipping Allah day and night. His mouth is so busy and his heart is so busy with remembering Allah. Can you do that? Remembering Allah, keep your mouth busy and keep your heart busy. Thinking of Allah, thinking of Allah. Allah, Allah, Allah. Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar, SubhanAllah, Alhamdulillah. Now some people might do that when they need help. But he didn't need anything because guess what? He was one of the richest people in all the land. Did he have wealth? He had buildings like houses and things like this. He had animals. He had cattle. He had everything. As far as the eye could see, all of the things belonged to him. And he had children. Lots of children. And he had big, strong children. He had a lot of family around him. He had a lot of fun. Because when you have wealth, you have money, you have power, you have children, you have family. He had everything. And he was still busy remembering Allah. Always remembering Allah. This is what it says in the old scriptures. This is what it says in the Quran. And this is what it says in the hadith of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa about Ayyub. Alayhi salam. Alayhi salam. Exactly. And one of the things that was amazing about him is that no matter what happened, he was still strong in his belief. Shall I tell you the whole story? Yes. Yeah, guess what? This gets good. This gets real good. Before I go any further, I have to go backward a little bit and remind you of some stories we told before. Remember, before Allah created Adam, who did he create? He created the jinn. Jinn are made from? Fire. Fire, right. You can't see them, but they're there. And they have free will. They can do what they want. They're not angels. But you can't see them just like you can't see the angels. One of them is named what? Iblis. And when Allah ordered all the creation to bow down because of the creation of the human being, Adam, all creation bowed down, illa Iblis, except Iblis. He wouldn't do it because why? He was proud. He, yes, his pride. He had so much pride. Now here's what happens. Allah tells him, you know, you're going to go to hell. And he said, okay, look at this man. He says, okay, I don't care. But just let me live long enough. Let me live as long as you have human beings, and I will take all of them to hell with me. Because you'll find they're disobedient. You'll find that they are not grateful to you. They don't have gratitude toward you. You'll see. Now this is Iblis talking to Allah like this. So Allah granted his request. And that's why he's still alive even now. And he is our enemy. And as we mentioned before in some of our other programs, when... Allah said in the Quran, Ya ayyuladina amanu udkhulu fi silmi khafatan. O you who believe, enter into Islam perfectly, but don't follow the footsteps of shaitan. Verily, he is your avowed enemy. Is he really our enemy? Well, let's find out in this story and see what happened. Allah said in the Quran, Ya ayyuladina amanu udkhulu fi silmi khafatan. O you who believe, enter into Islam perfectly, but don't follow the footsteps of shaitan. Verily, he is your avowed enemy. Is he really our enemy? Well, let's find out in this story and see what happened. Because Allah was telling Iblis, Look at my servant, Ayub. Do you see Ayub, how he is? He's always worshipping me. Look, day and night. He's busy worshipping me, thanking me, being so happy. For many years, by the way, not just a few years, Years and years and years and years and years, Ayub was so thankful to Allah. Well, Iblis was getting upset with that. He said, yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know, the only reason he's doing this is because you give him all this stuff. And Allah said, yes, and he's thankful. He said, no, no, no. He's just doing it so you won't take it away. That's all. But for sure, if you took it away from him, you will find him very much unappreciative. You'll see he'll stop. Allah said, I already know that's not right. But I will let you, he told the devil, I will let you have some authority here. But you can't 
do more than this. You can take some of his things away. We'll see what happens. Just go ahead. And sure enough, devil was happy. <laughs> Destroy all his cattle. Kill all the animals. Make everything go away from him. He has nothing left, you know. No animals and no, you know, things like this. But Ayub still was thanking Allah. He was still very much praising Allah. Alhamdulillah, Allah, 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 he didn't like this idea. So, he took on the shape of a wise man. And he went to him and he said, you know, uh, excuse me, Mr. Ayub, but uh, <laughs> you see, you see how Allah is uh, taking stuff away from you. You know how it is? Uh, maybe he likes somebody else better than you, or, you know. Ayub, he just increases decor to Allah. He says, you're wrong. That's not right. Because, he says, it's Allah's right to give to whoever he wants to. And it's Allah's right to take it away. It never belonged to me. It always belonged to Allah. And Allah has the ownership of everything. He is the owner of everything. So I was only temporary in charge of it. So no problem. <clears throat> Shaitan said, hmm. I went back to Allah, I said, okay, okay, yeah, he, he, all right, he's still, you know, making dick, he's still praying, did a lot of salah, you know salah? He did salah a lot, and Allah told Iblis, okay, see? Yeah, but, the only reason he's doing it now is because he got all his family around him, he got all these, you know, children, he's got all this going for him. If you just take away his family, then you'll see, because... Everybody, when they lose their family, when you lose somebody you love, then you'll see he's not going to be thankful to you anymore. Allah well, said, I already know he will be. But I will give you authority, but just over this, you'll see. He bleeds one. <laughs> Today's the day, boy. You know, you can imagine he's happy, huh? He got in there, and he did. What he did, he shook the foundation of one of the buildings, the big building where the family was. And made it fall down, and it killed them all. All of his children. All of his children died. Now, in the old books that they have, it says something similar, that all of his children died. And then Iblis took the shape of somebody who's coming to console him, like a friend will come, oh, sorry, like this. And he came to him, and he said to Ayub, um, you know, looks like... Looks like Allah, you know, is giving you a hard time here. Looks like Allah is maybe taking all this away from you. Maybe Allah is favoring somebody else and not favoring you anymore, you know. Hoping to make him, you know, like some people do that. They get upset, say, Yeah, Allah, why you did this to me? You know, this is what he wants him to do. But instead, look, you've said, Allah tests us with many things. And our family is a test. And it comes from Allah, it goes back to Allah. In fact, we know this in the Qur'an. We know it clearly in the Qur'an because Allah says, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun. Exactly. Everything comes from Allah. Everything returns back to Allah. And this is the way Ayub was. And he continued his dhikr to Allah, continued his salah, just keep going and going. And Allah said to Iblis, Told you so. Told you so. <laughs> Iblis is going crazy. Ah! Now he's going nuts. He said, uh, this, his health. That's the only reason, because he has all his health, and that's why he's keeping up it. He will, you take his health away from him, and he will curse you. Take his health away. Let him be sick, and you'll see. Allah said, okay, I'll give you this authority over him. But not his heart, and not his tongue. Everything else, go ahead. But I already know. Because Allah always knows everything, you know. So Iblis says, ah, now watch this. So he took away some of his health. He got sick. He got pretty sick. Then he got sicker. What did he do? He increased. And keep more dhikr to Allah, more salah. He says, ah. And make his body get worse. He took his body down, down. It's so sores. He had sores on his body. So bad. Even there was things in the sores, like maggots. Something crawling around in the sores. So bad. 
In one narration, the Prophet wasallam said that uh, he had a sore that was so bad that there was things eating, eating him in the sore. And one of them fell out on the ground. Ayub bent over, he picked it up, and he put it back. And somebody said, why'd you do that? He said, even this thing has the right to eat, so let him have his rights. Now, Iblis is going crazy. How can this man be like this? Hmm. So, Iblis went to his buddies. You know, Iblis has a lot of shayateen around them. You know that, right? A lot of shaitan. So, he went to them. He had a gathering. He said, okay, guys, tell me what to do with this guy. Now, we did this. Hmm? Took away his wealth. Took away his animals. Took away his family. Now, we're taking away his health. What do we do now? They said, well, we give up, man said, even Adam, remember how you tempted Adam to get him to go eat the fruit? And he ate it. And you tempted his wife and she ate it. They did it. This guy, he just, <laughs> he won't do anything. We don't have, what should we, we, we don't know. We give up on this guy. But at least he doesn't give up, does he? No way. He said, let me think, let me think, let me think. Took this stuff, got the family, the health. <laughs> there was one wife, one wife that didn't die. One wife who was very close, and she was taking care, so good care of Ayub. Even though he was sick and he could hardly move, she would go to him. She would serve She would give everything for him. She loved him very much. And he had been very good to her for all those years. And certainly she could take care of him. And she was trying her best over the years to take care of him in his sickness. So one day, Iblis took another shape. This time he took the shape of what? Of a man who came to her and said, Um, excuse me, where's your husband? She said, my husband? Well, over there. He said, that is your husband? A pile of rags? Uh, this bones? That's your husband? Okay. Uh... What did he do that was so bad that Allah is doing this to him? Now he planted a seed in her mind, you know. And she thought about it. Yeah. So she went to him and she was saying, Oh, my husband, you know, look at your shape and look what condition you're in. And this is bad, you know, really, really bad. It's just bones laying there. He can't even walk anymore. It's just skin over bones. Like this. She said to him, see, Shaitan talked to her. <laughs> she said, why don't you just pray? You're a prophet. Ask Allah. Just say, Allah, you know, fix the problem. Because Allah is merciful. Allah is generous. Just ask him. He said, oh, my wife. How many years did we have wealth and children? How many? She said, 80. 80 years. They had the best. He said, and how many years have I been sick? She said, seven. He said, so only seven years compared to 80 years of good. I'm way too shy in front of Allah from all that he's given me to complain about anything. This is from Allah and I'm fine with it. But you, you have come to me with the words of shaitan Shaitan has whispered in your ear to say these things to me. And he said to her, Wallahi, which means I swear by Allah, if I get strong again, I'm going to whip you 100 lashes. Now go from me, and I don't need from your hand a drink. I don't need from your hand any food. Because what I need, I need it only from Allah. So you take yourself and your shaitan voice and go. And I trust Allah. Because Allah is Rahman. Allah is Rahim. And what I need, I will get it from Him. And she's like, but, but. He said, take your but, but too and go. <laughs> yeah. Don't need this. And this was the condition he was in. Now shaitan gave up. That's it. Shaitan had to give up because there wasn't anything left. 
The only two things he had left was his heart and his tongue. His heart was still for Allah and his tongue was still praising Allah and never even ask Allah to take away his difficulty. Why? Because he knows everything is from Allah. Kulu min Allah. So what did Allah do? Allah took over the situation again. What do you think he did next? He caused the health to come back. He got his health back, got his strength back, and then Allah brought back all of his children, the same children, and double. His wealth, children, and more children, everything is coming back for him, everything. And he's strong. Now his wife, she missed him. She missed him a lot, you know. She loved him very, very much. So she came back. She was going to beg him, please take me back. But when she came back, she was surprised. <gasps> Who's this? Everything. That's fabulous. And the family. The children. And his health. My gosh. Young, strong-looking man again. Young, well, for his age. He's like, huh? What is this? And he's explaining. Again, everything is from Allah. Trust Allah. And Allah will make it good for you. Now, many people have called Job, or Ayu, the man of patience. The man of patience. Now, in Arabic, there's a beautiful name that if you have children and you'd like to give them the best name, it, of course, is the servant of Allah, Abdullah. Another one is Abdul Rahim and Abdul Rahman. The servant of the one who is the most merciful, the most gracious, yes. But there is another one called Abdus Sabur. From the word what? Sabur. 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 What is, can you tell me what Sabur? Patience. Do you know I used to think it was just patience till I looked in the Maurid. There's a dictionary in Arabic called the Maurid. And when I looked in there, I found that Sabur is a big word. It means to be strong in what you're on and don't move. Stay right where you are. Don't move. Stay there. Be patient. Be right there. Be steadfast. Don't give up. No matter what, you stay with it. Now, we learn a lot from this story. One of the things we learn from this story is sometimes when you think somebody's coming to you with some good advice, it's shaitan. It's not good advice. Even when it looks like a wise man telling you something, could be shaitan. Even when it's somebody come to you trying to make you feel nice, shaitan. Somebody coming to you, oh, you know, let me give you advice about something, shaitan. Because only and only if Somebody's telling you to follow the right way, then this is not shaitan. Because shaitan doesn't tell you to follow the right way. Unless he tells you so that he can make you go excess and do too much, which we talked about before. So that's something about the stories of the prophets of Allah. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, who Allah the Muslimin. The praise to Allah, and he's the one that made us Muslims. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah. What I like to do now is talk to you about a subject that we've spoken about in some of the previous programs. It's something very special to me, and I hope that all of us get some benefit from this. But some people come and they say things like, well, why do bad things happen to good people? And you say, well, you know, it's from Allah. And they say, yeah, really? Well, how about a lady, she's believing in Allah, but she gets cancer and dies. And how about a man, he doesn't believe in Allah, but he lives for a very long time and he has a lot of money. And how about somebody over here, they believe in Allah, but they have a car accident, they lose their leg. Somebody else doesn't believe in Allah, they rob a bank, they don't even get caught. One of the things that came in my mind, before I was even a Muslim, is that there must be a God because I can see how so many things fit together. Everything makes sense, except when you come to this subject. You would think, oh, this man is very nice. This lady is very nice. 
seems like to me that they would have very, a lot of good stuff, right? They should have a big house, nice car, lots of money, easy life, because they're doing the right things. But they have difficulty. And another guy, and I know some real people, by the way, not nice at all, crooks, really cheaters, bad people. But they have big house, they got nice car, and they don't seem to have any problems. One day, somebody asked the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, about this subject. They were asking, how come bad things are happening to good people? Look at the story that he told, and it was an amazing story to me. He said, there would be two people that will go through this life. One of them, from the time he's born until the time he dies, he will always get anything he asks for from Allah. Anything he wants, he gets it. Even when he's going to die, when Malakal Mote, the angel of death, comes to him, he asks, wait, I want to have a feast. I want to eat a big meal. And it comes to him and he eats it before he dies. Then there'll be the other person. No matter what he asks for from Allah through his whole life, he's not getting much. Even so much so that when he's about to die, all he wants is a glass of water. But he doesn't even get to drink that before the angel pulls his soul and takes him out. Now these two people will be brought on the day of judgment. The one who had everything in this life, Allah will cause him to be put into the hellfire. Just for a second. Like when you put a pin in something and pull it out. Just like that. And then just that second. He'll be asked a question. By the way, in your whole life on the earth, did you ever see anything good? And remember, he got everything he wanted. He said, Wallahi, I swear by Almighty Allah in my whole life, I never saw anything good. What wiped it out? One second in hell wipes out all the good of this life. The other man who had such a hard time didn't get the things he wanted. He would be put into the Jannah. Jannah means what? Paradise. Paradise. Heaven. A cool place, eh? He would be put in there like you put a pin in something. Pull it out. Then he'd be asked the question. In your whole life, did you ever see any difficulty? He says, Wallahi, I swear by Allah, in my whole life I never saw anything bad. Now, Muhammad's companions were confused a bit, and they want to know more why a man has everything in the life, he has to go to hell, another man is having a hard time, and he goes to paradise, and they need some understanding. Prophet Sallallahu is telling them that nobody's perfect. Well, now in my case, I, that made me happy, because I know I'm not perfect. You're not perfect, are you? No, none of us are. In fact, he said nobody's perfectly bad, and nobody's perfectly good. In the case of the first man, the guy who was getting everything, he was actually a bad man. In fact, he was so bad, he was so evil, that Allah hated him. But the man did do some good deeds. So Allah gave him all of his reward right here in this life. So that on the day of judgment, he would not even get to use his nose for what? Smelling the paradise. Not even a whiff into hell. The other man, by the way, we seek refuge with Allah from that. The other man, though, this man, he was actually a very good, good, good man. Allah loved him so much, but he did some bad stuff. And Allah didn't want him to even smell the hellfire. So, Allah gave him his punishment in this life. He didn't have to go to hell because he got some punishment here. Then on the day of judgment, he could go right to paradise. So we learned some stuff from this. In fact, we know in Islam that in the next life, some people will go directly to Jannah, to paradise. In fact, whoever is doing their salah on time, 
five times a day, their salah is good and acceptable, they don't even have to worry about the Day of Judgment, Yom Hisab. Prophet Sallallahu said, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, told us, these people who keep up their salah, their prayers on time every day, then, if it's accepted, they will go straight into paradise. Good news. Oh, by the way, if your prayers aren't in order, then the angels will still go and look at your extra prayers, and maybe they'll find enough from there that's acceptable. You can still go in. Good news. But what about some people who have too many bad deeds? They just don't have enough good deeds to get to Jannah. They're believers. They believe in a lot, but they get lots of bad deeds. And there's a lot of us around here who's got too many bad deeds. Well, we know that they also can go to hell, but they can get out. Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu on the Day of Judgment, he will actually be asking Allah to take some people out of hellfire. And Allah will allow that. First, the people who are only in the fire up to their ankles, and they'll get to come out. Then, some people who are in maybe like to their knees, some who are in the fire up to their neck even. And then finally, the people who just had belief in Allah equal to the grain of a, you know, like the wheat or rice, some little small thing like that. How do you know about mustard seeds? You know what that is? It's like a little teeny round, you know, tiny thing. If sometimes when you get like hamburger or something like this, you look on top, it has those little seed things like small. If you have even belief in Allah, even belief in Allah, this small amount, you will not stay in the hellfire. So the belief in Allah is number one, very important. But what I was mentioning about this, so that it helps me to understand. So when people come to us and they say, well, okay, this guy he thinks uh, there's a law, but look, Allah gave him cancer. So what? We learned the story from Ayub. Do you remember the story of Ayub we talked about once? And we said how he got really, really sick, but he still didn't even ask Allah to cure him. He didn't. He said it's from Allah. The last thing Ayub said, the last thing he said before Allah cured him, he didn't ask Allah to cure him. He just said, Allah, this is my condition. Look, here I am. And he said, you're the merciful. You're the one who gives mercy. That's all he said. And so that's when Allah gave him all the mercy and brought him back and restored his health, restored to him his family, restored to him his wealth and all the things that he had. And these things are all uh, nice for us to have, although we don't have to have all this in this life because we want to have a good life in the next life because that's where everything's perfect in the Jannah. There's a saying that goes something like this. I want you to think about this. It says... If money is lost, nothing is lost. If health is lost, something's lost. But if the faith is lost, all is lost. So it's important always to remember your faith in Allah. Keep up your faith in Allah. Trust Allah. No matter what happens to you, no matter how is the difficulties coming to you, no matter what happens, and no, it doesn't matter who is saying stuff to you, it's up to you to trust Allah. Trust Allah and He'll make it right. But it's important always to remember your faith in Allah. Keep up your faith in Allah. Trust Allah. No matter what happens to you, no matter how is the difficulties coming to you, no matter what happens, and no, it doesn't matter who is saying stuff to you, it's up to you to trust Allah. Trust Allah and He'll make it right. One of the things that Allah doesn't like is when we complain. Allah does not like you to complain unless you complain to Him. That's the only complaining Allah likes. Be like Ayub, and remember what he did? He just kept thanking Allah. Thanking Allah. And if you think about it, we have a lot to be thankful for. Who gave us life? Allah. Who gives us air to breathe? Allah. Is this important to have air? Do you know that they're spending billions of dollars sending rocket ships up to Mars and to the moon and they can't find any air anywhere? There's no air except here. Who's giving this? This air. Allah. Yes. It comes from all these plants, they tell us. Oh, the plants give us the air. But who created the plants? Allah. Allah made us have lungs that will absorb this air and breathe it. 
Who did it? Allah. Do we say thank you? No. I don't remember the last time I said to myself, thanks Allah for that tree in my lungs. I don't remember that. I should, but I don't think about it. Why? Because I'm breathing. But the minute you take a breath and nothing happens, what will you do? <gasps> oh. Then you'll think about Allah, but it'll be too late. Huh? So, just the air. What about food? What about your eyes? Tell you about that. One time, this Prophet Muhammad, he told us about this story. He said, one time there will be a man that Allah made him that he had no bad deeds. It's just a story to help us understand. Man had no bad deeds. Well, only angels like that. But with no bad deeds at all, and he did only good deeds in his whole life. So when he died, he comes in front of Allah. He has a mountain of good deeds, a mountain of good deeds, and no bad deeds. So the angel asks him, would you like to go to Jannah on your good deeds? Or would you like to go to Jannah on the mercy of Allah? Now, the, in Arabic, it's Rahmah of Allah. Allah's Rahmah, which is better than the word mercy, but we don't have this word in English. Allah's Rahmah. And the man said, well, I don't have any bad deeds. All I got is good deeds. So I'll go in on my good deeds. The angels commanded to bring out Al-Mizan. What is Al-Mizan, do you know? Have you ever been in a play park? Did you go to a play park sometime? And you get on one side of a board and some boy will get on the other side and you go like this on the board. What's that called? Bali. Called seesaw. Called uh, teeter-totter or balance. It's called a balance, yeah? So they brought the mizan, the balance. And on one side of the mizan they put all of his good deeds, this whole mountain of good deeds that he did. But on the other side... They put one eye, one eye from this man. Because Allah gives you mercy for an eye. The one eye outweighed all of his good deeds. They said, now would you like to go in on Allah's mercy or your good deeds? He said, I'll go in on Allah's mercy. And that's how he went to paradise. This helps us to understand something, but there are some details here that are easy for you to think about. Suppose somebody gets really, really old, huh? and they're about to die. How much would they pay for another year of life? If they're just about to die, how much would they pay to live another year? Whatever they got. It wouldn't matter, would it? If somebody's about to die, you said, it's $10 million, you want to live another year. I say, okay. Where do I sign? You, you take credit card? <laughs> it will. Because we don't value our life and what we have until we lose it. Whenever somebody loses their hearing and they can't hear anymore, then people will spend a lot of money to get their hearing back, yes? If you can't see anymore, people will spend a lot of money trying to make it so you can see. And how about this? When you can't go to the bathroom properly and you have something wrong inside of you, they spend millions trying to find out ways to just do this. And we take it for granted. It's not it's like, what are you talking about? Yes. All of these things we need. We need to be able to eat. We need to be able to sleep. We need eyes. We need ears. We need all of this. And all of it came to us free. Free from Allah. And when was the last time I said, thank you, Allah, for what you gave me? This helps us to understand a couple of points. The first one is why it's so important to say thank you. The other thing is why it's so important not to say thank you to something else that Allah created. Let me give you an example of that. Suppose, suppose that you had a lovely meal at my house and you liked it. You said, could I have some more of the curry? Yes, more curry. Oh, the rice is nice. Nice rice. Okay. Uh, could I have some more of that mango lassi? Oh, sure. Uh, more tea? Yes. Oh, so full, I can hardly move. <sighs> and? And I'm happy. And? I'm waiting to hear thank you, see? I'm not hearing it. And then when you get up, you go, oh, wow. And you walk outside to my tree and you go, thank you, tree, for a lovely meal. <laughs>
in Arabic, I'm going to say, Anta Majnoon? Are you crazy? What are you talking to my tree? Who gave you the food? Me. Why are you talking to the tree? So human beings, they do the same thing. When they go to Allah and say thank you to Allah, this makes Allah very happy. But when they go to something Allah created, it doesn't work. He gets very angry about that. So it's called false worship, making gods beside Allah. And Allah hates that. In fact, he won't forgive it. There are many people who worship Allah, but they worship something with Allah. All of the prophets always, always told people, worship Allah. Give your love to Allah. Give your devotion to Allah. Not to anybody and not to anything. So this is a very important point for us to always remember. Asking Allah, asking Allah, and it makes Allah happy with you. Now, there's a, some other points that go along with this too that I think that are, are interesting because the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, taught us that when people are sincere, that Allah will forgive them too. Because we make mistakes. Sometimes Allah will forgive you in this life, Sometimes he'll forgive you in the next life, and sometimes he'll punish you for a while, but he's still going to forgive you as long as you believe in him. So you can't lose. If you're a believer, you can't lose. Eventually, you will be in paradise. But of course, the goal is, let's get there as quick as possible. Hmm? Yeah. And remembering always, we have this evil one around us trying to trick us and to do the wrong thing. His name is what? Shaitan. Shaitan, Iblis, yes, yes. Oh, by the way, I was thinking about something the other day, and I wanted to tell you guys about it. You remember when we talked about the two letters, Sin and Sheen? You remember that? And we talked about Sham and Sam, the tribe that came from Noah, Sham, or Sam. And also we talked about Salam and Shalom. Remember that? Yeah. The Sin Sheen? Well, we say Shaitan. In English, he's called Satan or Satan. Did you know that? It's the same problem of this scene, sheen thing. So, although it doesn't really matter, but if you talk to somebody in English, a lot of the English speakers, they have learned from the Jewish scripture or the Christian scripture, which has the reverse of the scene sheen. I don't know if you knew that. But Satan is shaitan, and it doesn't matter what you call him, he's still the devil, isn't he? His idea to come to us, to stimulate us, to make us disobey Allah. The whole idea behind him is to disobey Allah. Because once you start, it's easy to do the next one. We talked about it before, but it's worth it to mention it again. Allah gives you a chance from the time you're born to the time you die to believe in him. He gives it to everybody. Everybody has the same chance. But he also gives everybody a test. We said that before too. And this is a test for all of us. And a part of it, the biggest part of our test is this shaitan who comes to you. Now, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he told us that when you're born, that Allah attaches to you something close as your juggler, right? Huh? That's your juggler vein, where the blood goes through right there. Huh? And this thing is called a kareen. And this thing is always going to be working against you. Now, you have a heart, and your heart is working in the right way, should be. But then you have this enemy, so it's kind of like this dichotomy, kicking back and forth, good, bad, evil, good, back, forth, back, forth. That's why sometimes you get a good idea. You say, I like to do something nice today. I would like to help somebody. I like to make somebody happy. I like to do so and so. But then this bad thing says, nah, why don't you do this? Why don't you? <laughs> for instance, maybe you get a good idea. You say, I would like to put the chair for somebody to sit down. And at the last minute as they're sitting down, you go, <laughs> Zip. <laughs> ha, ha, ha. And the person falls down and they get hurt. And everybody's going, ha, ha, ha. Who told you to do that? Shaitan. There's no doubt about it. And what will happen? This is a bad deed. A very bad, bad, bad deed. And then you might think, well, it doesn't mean I don't believe in a law. But watch what happens. It starts out the same way every time with being proud. You're proud of yourself that you pulled a trick on somebody. <laughs> well, this is a kind of pride. 
when you start doing stuff like that. <laughs> so Prophet Muhammad, he warned his companions. He said, nobody will go into the Jannah if they have even a mustard seed. You remember you told me about the mustard seed, yeah? He said, even if they have the mustard seed of kibber, pride, they will not enter Jannah. And they were like, huh? Because they asked him, wait a minute, wait a minute. If I get new shoes and laces, I'm really happy. I'm proud of my new shoes. Another one, he said, yeah, when I get a new dress, I like my clothes. I'm proud of it. He said, no, 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 no. It's not that. It's when you have a big mouth. And you know what I mean by that, huh? And arrogance. Ah, yeah, 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 man. Yeah, you know how... Like this way. <laughs> this is something really bad that Allah hates. And when you have this, even like what? The grain, what's you call it? Mustard. Mustard seed. You will not enter the Jannah. And it's called shirk. It's a kind of shirk because you think you have kibber arm. <laughs> kibber. Kibber. Baby. This, you know, listen. This is the same word for the word akbar. And only Allah is akbar. Allahu? Akbar. Allahu? Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Allah. 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 Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Who Allah the Jalan the Muslimin. The praise to Allah, and He's the one that made us Muslims. Alhamdulillah. I was thinking about something. I was thinking how the human being through their whole life, from the time they're born till the time they die, from the time they wake up in the morning till the time they go to bed at night, there are two main things that are always coming to the human being. And that is a fear of the things that they don't like and a hope for the things that they do like. Would you like to know how to say that in Arabic? Can you say Tarheeb? Tarheeb! This means something you're afraid of, a threat. Somebody threatens you with something. This is going to happen to you if you don't do this and that and do and da da. This is what? Tarheeb! And then if something you like. It's promised to you. You do this, you get ice cream, you get the day off, you can have la 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 la. And this is targhib. Targhib. So the targhib is something I want and the... Uh, something I don't want. And this is what the human being goes through their whole life. It's what they call fear of a loss and hope of a reward. And so these two things, when I think about it, I remember there's a prophet who lived long time ago and he was talking to his people about the very subject I'm talking to you about. Would you like to know who's this prophet? His name is Shuaib. Can you say Shuaib? Shuaib. Shuaib. You said it better than me. It has like a in it. Uh, Shuaib. Shuaib. Yeah. With I? Very good. Alayhi salam. Peace be upon him. Very good. Now, these people, they live, by the way, they, they were called the people of Midian because uh, the area where they were. And they lived in what is today part of Syria or Syria. They were descendants from Noah, I guess, and they were in a, a time period when they didn't worship Allah anymore. Because the people of Noah, they learned about worshiping Allah without any partners. And then people after that, if you remember the people from Sham, Remember Sam, those people? Sam, and they went south into Arabia. There was Thamud, the tribe of Ad. There was the Aras, those people down there. And Hydromote, and Oman, and Yaman. You remember that? We talked about that? Okay. But then these people were not like those, because they started worshiping something with Allah. These people totally forgot about Allah. And what did they worship? If I tell you, you're going to laugh. They were worshipping a tree, but not a big tree, a short tree. <laughs> in the old scriptures, you find this in the Bible, there's a part of the, it tells them, do not be like these people. It tells them, don't be like these people, don't go out in the woods, don't cut the tree, 
Don't carry it on your back in your house and don't spread it around, decorate your house with it, thinking it's going to give you what you want or being afraid of it. It's exactly the same thing, thinking it's going to hurt you or something like that. It said the tree cannot benefit you, nor can it hurt you, because it's just a tree. And yet, by the way, some people today, what do they do? They cut a tree, they put it in their house, they put lights on it. It's amazing, isn't it? <laughs> what some people will do. But now Shu'ayb was a prophet that Allah sent to these people of Midian. They had a bigger problem than you can imagine. Shirk, worshiping other than Allah, is of course the biggest problem. They had other problems too. They had a habit of stealing, lying, and cheating. When anybody would go to their area, when they'd be coming along, you'd be like riding in there like everything's going along good, then all of a sudden, boom, they would jump out. And they would rob them. They would take some of what they had and consider it was okay. Not like a robber who just takes everything. They were taking part of what people had, like a tax or something, you know? So if somebody had 10 bags of rice, they would take one. If he had 10 sheep, they're going to take one. If he had 10 garments that he wants to sell, they will take one. If he had 20, they would take how many? Two. Two, right, yeah. If he had 100, how many would he take? Ten. Ten. Yeah, you guys are doing math in here. Oh, we'll turn it into a math class. <laughs> so this means they took 10% of what anybody brought into their area, and they were the first people to do such as this. But that's not all. Whenever they dealt with anybody, they always wanted to make sure they got what they wanted and extra. But whenever they sold anything to anybody, they wanted to be sure they didn't give them everything that was supposed to come to them. And this is called short measure. Short measure. And not giving people full measure. Now, Allah speaks about that in the Quran, about giving people short measure. But when you got it for yourself, you want the full measure. So when Shuaib came to them, he was trying to call them away from that and tell them, guys, you know, this isn't right. But the first thing he told them about wasn't about the stealing. It wasn't about the cheating, and it wasn't about the lying. By the way, in their lying, you know what they did? They would tell people, oh, this is the best shirt. If you have this shirt right here, you could be amazed. Because something like this, blah, 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 and they will lie and say it's the best. And it's not the best. Maybe it's not even good, you know. And if this sheep, oh, my gosh, this sheep, boy, he's only three years old. And maybe he's 30 years old. No, <laughs> yeah, they don't care. They will lie. So they're liars, they're cheaters, and stealers, thieves, they steal. But Shreib came to them first to tell them about what? Don't worship the tree. Don't worship that, because that's where everything always starts in false worship. And so he was telling them, you know, to worship Allah, and Allah is the one to be worshipped with no partners. Now look at these guys. They totally didn't believe in Allah at all. It wasn't a matter of saying Allah plus something, like some religion. They believe in Allah, but they worship somebody or something along with Allah. But they were so bad. They were worshiping this tree. And they would say, well, why should we believe in Allah? What proof do you have? So Allah sent miracles with Shuaib. Shuaib was doing miracles in front of them. And they still didn't believe. They would see a miracle. And they'd be like, heck. So, I don't know how you did it, but whatever. And he kept telling them and telling them. Now, some people did believe when they saw the miracles. Some Always when there's miracles, some people will believe. Something amazing, there'll be some people believe, you know, usually. But most of them, no, they didn't. So there were followers of Shoaib who believed that there really was a law and that they really should start thinking about a law. And when people think about a law, the next thing to learn is to tell the truth. Because when you say there's only one God, and He's the only God, this is the biggest truth there is, which will help you. Because then when you deal with the people, you'll think, mm, well, I didn't lie about the big thing, why should I lie about the small things? Huh? So you begin to tell the truth, and they would tell the truth. You begin to deal fair with people, because you know Allah is watching you, and you know you'll be in trouble with Allah. And you begin to learn about the real Tarheeb and Tarheeb. Now, the real deal here is, 
that if you believe in Allah, you're afraid of the promise to come for the bad people, which is what? To get bad in this life and to go to hell in the next life. But the good thing you get from Allah is targhib, and that is a promise of good for you in this life and good for you in the next life. But this is only going to come to who? The believers. Allah sent miracles. And then, of course, to act on that and do the amal, salihat, the good, righteous deed. The people who didn't believe, they were really obstinate, very stubborn, and very dumb. No matter what happened, they would say stupid things, you know, like, yeah, I don't believe you, it doesn't matter. And you see miracles, and they're like, eh, so what? And they gave Shoaib such a hard time. But Shoaib, his patience, he had very good patience. Remember we talked about other prophets that had good patience. When bad things happened to them, they would be patient. He was so patient. He would say, okay, well, take it easy. And we have our belief, and you have yours. And we know about the promise of Allah that's coming. So let us just be patient and wait and see. And the other people going like, oh, get out of here. But then one time they got really upset with him. And they said, if it wasn't for your family that you come from, your tribe, we would stone you to death. This is the threat that they gave him. He said, you're afraid of my family? You won't stone me because of my family? But you don't fear Allah? But you're afraid of my family? Or just people? But you don't fear Allah? Ajib, this is amazing. You see what he was showing them? You're afraid of people, but you're not afraid of the law? What's going to happen? Well, they were patient, and they waited. But the other people, of course, they kept doing what they do, which is cheating. When they would sell anything, and they want to weigh it out and measure it out. Okay, you want to buy this from me? Okay, it weighs three pounds. And you say, it looks like two. Wait a minute. Now it's three. So he's weighing his thumb with it. <laughs> Some butchers might do that, you know. And... Whenever he wants to buy something, he said, no, oh, no, you know, and he'd take extra and give you a hard time. Or when he wants to pay, he don't want to give you all the money. They were very, very bakhil. What is bakhil? Stingy. They were so stingy. But always the promise of Allah will come. What Allah promises is going to happen. When he promises good, it's going to come. And when he promises bad, that's going to come too. Well, these people, and a, a lot of the stories I've been telling you, you know, these people depend on water for their crops, water for their animals, and water to live. Water is a very important part of every human being's life. All of us need water, and they were no different. Now, Allah had given them a lot. They had a lot, and they were in good shape. But, of course, they wanted more and more and more. And their prophet's telling them, it's going to come, it's going to come, and they're like, out of here and then one day it came a big cloud and they said see haha <laughs> we're gonna get rain we wanted some more water rains coming the big cloud is coming and we're gonna be fine ha <laughs> ha so they were looking thinking the big rain was gonna be tarheeb but it wasn't it was the promise of Allah the tarheeb and it came and it came so hard and amazing thing was, the way that it comes, you're looking up, where's the water? No, it was fire. Can fire come from a cloud? No. no. What about lightning? Can lightning come from a cloud? Yes. Lightning makes what? Fire. Big fire. So here now is lightning coming. Wham, bam, boom. On, and which is scary in itself. And big fire and shocking them Blah! and then of course you get along with that wind and all the things that come and again just as in the past with other peoples Allah destroyed them all every one of them because Allah's promise always comes in the meantime the people who believed and were following the prophet Shoaib Allah spared them he saved them because Allah's promise is true both ways the promise of Tarheeb, the punishment, and they came. Promise of Tarheeb, which is the good things that you like, and it came. And this is the story of those people. Now, Prophet Muhammad, 
peace and blessing be upon him, his last prophet, and he told us exactly the same thing, that people live in between these two things all the time. They're looking for the good that they can have, the promise, the tarib, and they're afraid of the promise of the bad, the threat that things will come at them. So what we have to do is realize that when anything comes our way, as believers, as Muslims, as the ones who believe in Allah, these difficulties that we have can be good for us. And then those things which we think are good for us, they could actually be bad for us. Let's look at a verse in the Quran and think about it. The verse is in Surah Al-Fajr. It's chapter 89 in the Quran, if you go by the numbers like I do. And it tells us in there that whenever Allah tests one of the human beings, He tests the mankind by giving them good. So see, Allah is calling it ibtila. He's calling a test when He gives you something good. He didn't say it was really good. He just said it's a test. And He gives you something called na'mah. What does na'mah mean? A favor from Allah. And which is barakah from Allah, which you say blessings, things like that. You're looking at it like, yeah, 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 I got this, I got that. Wow, I got all these things, whoa. He says that his servant is going to say what? Allah loves me, look how much Allah loves me. He gave me this, he gave me this. I got a brand new Game Boy, you know, at home playing, having a good time. <laughs> got new Barbie dolls, I got all this stuff going on, you know. And then Allah said in the next verse, but... Whenever we test him by taking away things that he likes, like what? Oh, man, oh, you know, we don't have all this money anymore. Now I don't have the fancy clothes. Maybe I don't get to go to this school anymore. I, I lost this or I lost that. Maybe somebody dies in your family. It hurts and you feel like, oh. And then what he said? Allah says that the human being will say, Allah disgraced me. Allah disarmed me. Look what Allah did to me. And then Allah says, Kalabaltu. Because he's saying here, this is the emphasis for you to see that Allah is saying big time, no way. That is not true. In fact, and then Allah goes on to tell you, the reason for this is because you don't take care of the people who are poor. You don't feed these orphans. There's little children in the street. They don't have anything. You don't care about them. You just go, eh, ah. I don't care about the yatim. These are the children with no parents. And you don't feed the poor. And when you don't take care of the poor, and you don't take care of the orphans, then be ready, because that's the beginning of a trouble for you. Because Allah likes it when you take care of the poor and the orphans. Anyway, I want to come back to this thing about having this test that comes to you. Some people think, that if I have the good in this world, it means Allah loves me. But whenever they don't have something, they say, Allah hates me. And it's not true. You want me to give you the story of what Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said? He used a word called ajib. Do you know this word, ajib? Say ajib. 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 What does it mean? Amazing. Ajib, amazing. Next time you want to tell your friends amazing, say, Ajib. <laughs> and they say, what does that say? It means amazing. Because Prophet Muhammad, he said, peace be upon him, amazing, Ajib is the condition, the condition of a true believer. Because only good is going to happen to him. Only good is going to happen to him. Now, how is that? If you think about this, because we know many of the believers have difficulties, yeah? Sure. But Allah's messenger is saying, no, it's all good for him. It's all going to be good for him. For instance, if anything good comes his way, like it mentioned in the first part of that ayah, then he's happy and he praises the law. Alhamdulillah. You get something coming? Alhamdulillah. This ha Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah. But when the bad things come and the test called ibtila from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, any difficulty, any fitna comes from Allah, then what does he say? Alhamdulillah still, and he's patient. And we talked about that before, about being patient. Because the patience to just be able to say, Alhamdulillah, 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 and not get upset, not get angry. And Allah speaks to us through the Quran. 
And he tells us that the things that we like, sometimes they're not good for us. Sometimes you like a thing, it's not good for you. And sometimes you don't like something, but it was good for you. Would you let me give you an example of this? Suppose you like to watch the cable TV, huh? You think it's good for you? But it's not good for you. And if the cable TV quits working, you say, oh, this is bad. But actually, this is good for you. Because there's a lot of things on there that you shouldn't watch. They won't help you. They could hurt you, damage you. So many times human beings think, oh, this is good. But it's not good to Allah. Or they say, this is bad. But it's not bad to Allah. Now, a believer in Allah is ajib, amazing. His condition is amazing. And the Prophet ﷺ said it. Because whenever anything good comes his way, he's thankful to Allah. He says, Alhamdulillah. But any difficulty comes his way, he's patient with Allah. And these are some of the stories that we've heard from these prophets. How that good things came and look, they were patient with good and patient with bad. You might say, well, what do you mean patient with good? Because sometimes when good stuff comes to you, you get too excited. Ah, 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 ah. You don't have to be like that because you don't know exactly what good is in it or what bad is in it. And also, when any difficulty comes, you don't have to think it's all bad. There can be good things that come out of everything. So the patience that we learn, maybe it's just a lot of teaching us a lesson, but we're patient. Prophet Sallallahu said, and it's good for them. Good for them. But it's only going to be in the case of a believer. Because what? For believers, everything is good. Because they believe in Allah. If it rains, who sent the rain? Allah. If it's sun, who gives you the sun? Allah. If you can walk, it's from Allah. But what if you can't walk? That's also from Allah. Sometimes people get upset, like they miss their bus. I want to go somewhere, I go down, I get my ticket, I'm going to get on the bus. I miss the bus. I miss the bus. Oh, I miss this bus. Gosh darn. Now I'm going to be late. I'm going to have this problem. I'm blah. So if I get upset about it and I don't say Alhamdulillah and be patient, then what's going to happen? I get oh, so angry. Somebody comes along and they say, Hey, Yusuf, how you doing? Oh, shut up. Who's that? Because I'm upset, you know. Somebody says, Sir, how are you doing? That? Get away from me. You know, um, I miss my bus. Huh? I'm upset. Finally, I get a ride, and I'm going, and I come. Oh, guess what happened? The bus that I missed, it went off the road. They had an accident. If I would have been in that bus, I would have had an accident. So what should I say? Alhamdulillah. Ooh, I'm glad I missed that bus. And this happens a lot of times that we don't know the bad thing we missed by not having something happen. And likewise, we get sad when something happened, like somebody dies or somebody gets really sick, but we don't realize this also is from Allah. One of the things that I learned after I came into Islam, it really helped me a lot. One sad event for every parent is if their child dies. This is real hard. No parent wants to outlive their children because it's hard for you if your parents die, but it's real hard if your children die. You just can't believe it. Oh, my God, I had so many plans. You're thinking, you know, I want my child to do this. I want him to go to school here. And they're going to do this and this. And then all of a sudden, all those plans are gone because the child is dead. That hurts. It hurts so much. But when I came into Islam, I found something good about this. And that is, Prophet Muhammad taught us, peace be upon him, all children, when they die, they go to heaven. They go to paradise. Now, that means even if the parents are not Muslim, let us suppose that, for instance, a child's parents are Buddhists. That's not Muslim. Or Hindu. That's not Muslim. Christian. That's not Muslim. Jewish. Not Muslim. Does it matter? The children to Allah are already innocent. And so all the children are going to go to paradise. Doesn't matter. That's good, yeah? Thank you, Allah, for this day. Thank you for letting us be together. And thank you for sending your book to us so that we know about our life. And thank you for sending us the prophets. And we ask Allah that he will bless us to understand the meaning and use it in our lives. Amin. Amin. Amin.